This is episode 10 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll take complex things and make them seem insanely simple. They make your boring drive to work feel exhilarating. They give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. All right. How's everybody doing? This is Preston Pish, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson. And today we have an awesome guest for you. Peter Godet is with us. Uh, Peter currently owns his own private investment bank, and he's going to be talking to us today about venture capital. So there's a lot of people out there that uh, might not necessarily know what venture capital does. Peter is going to teach us uh, some very important lessons and uh, provide you with some fantastic information. So without further delay, I'm going to have uh, Peter kind of introduce himself and give you a, a better background of, of his experiences in the financial industry. And so Peter, go ahead and uh, give us an intro about yourself. Sure. Happy to do it. Uh, let's see. Let's go all the way back to a place that um, that's near and dear to my heart, uh, West Point. And that was uh, 1991. I graduated there, played some rugby and majored in economics. And then I went out to uh, the world of the army and uh, jumped out of airplanes and went over to the DMZ in Korea, um, learned a lot about the Army on the DMZ, came back to Fort Lewis, Washington, where I was an executive officer for a battery over there. And then I decided to come back to New York, where I grew up, and uh, get married, settle down. And I also worked for West Point Admissions for quite a few years, about eight years uh, in the reserves while I was starting out my career in finance. And... Uh, Started out with Merrill Lynch uh, back in 1994, which was the year where the Fed uh, did some uh, crazy things with interest rates. Uh, so I jumped right into that, and uh, it seems like I have jumped into situations where there was always something going on, something happening. So um, it was uh, uncanny how I seemed to be right place, right time for some some action. So although I never got to combat in the military. Um, I tried. I was on the DMZ, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I certainly have been to financial combat several times, uh, whether it was the internet, whether it was uh, the subprime crisis, um, and whether it was that first year when we kind of fastened our seatbelts and, and rode through 1994 with, uh, with the Fed uh, raising rates many times. So we'll definitely have to bring you back on the show for a, as, as interest rates change, because that's Stig and I's biggest uh, thing that we like to talk about, because we see that as like the number one critical variable that controls all market swings and everything like that. So yeah, having you to maybe come back and discuss some of that as things start heading up, uh, I think would be a good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought the, uh, the U S government wasn't going to let interest rates rise. You know? <laughs> 17 trillion in debt. Uh, it's like, why don't we keep them low? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're only on what, six, seven years now where they've been, uh, next to nothing. I mean, I'm sure that won't have any kind of impact in the future. Exactly. Hit the gas on inflation and keep interest rates low. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go buy bonds. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, Stig. So uh, you go ahead and fire away the first question here. Yeah. So, Peter, I'm really uh, curious about this venture capital. And I heard a lot of rumors and a lot of stories about venture capital. But looking from within, uh, what, how, can you, uh, how can you best describe uh, venture capital? Someone perhaps that doesn't know what it is. Sure. Uh, it's investing in small private companies. I mean, that's, that's your, your basic, uh, simplest definition. Um, you know, and, and with venture capital, it's something that I've actually done in my career in alternative investments, almost on the side, investing in other companies uh, as I was running, you know, more major financial businesses. Um, but basically, it's, it's one and the same. If you're looking at private equity, maybe you're looking at, you know, anything from on the debt side to the equity side, you're looking at a capital structure of a firm, it's the same thing. It's either small or large, but it's the same thing where you're trying to optimize the capital structure and figure out what's the best way to get that company from you know, one point to another point uh, and making sure that uh, you're doing it the right way. So whether it's a small company, which I'm involved in now, making investments and raising capital for smaller companies on the venture capital side, or uh, larger companies, whether it's a structured credit company, um, where you're doing some financial engineering um, or going out and doing some, uh, some tax structured work. You know, it's, it's all about where's the capital structure, how do you optimize it, and how do you take care of the needs um, of, a, of a business 
owner that's trying to focus on their business almost myopically and not realizing, okay, I'm going to need, you know, X amount of fuel in the tank to get through phase one, phase two, phase three of the growth of the business. And I need someone, not, not a commercial bank that's just going to give me one loan, but I need somebody who's going to ride through that process with me and make sure that I'm getting the capital I need at the point in time that I need it. Okay. So, you know, one thing I often hear when I talk to other people about venture capital is that they always ask, this sounds very risky because you're working with sometimes debt and sometimes, you know, small companies because by nature, it's small companies. So do you think it's a more risky game or is it just not always people knowing what venture capital really is? Uh, well, it's all about knowledge. And, uh, and you know, when I was younger... <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> when I was younger and I was at uh, DLJ back in the day, I left Merrill Lynch to go to work. Uh, again, it was right place, right time. Alternative Investments wasn't even called Alternative Investments not so long ago, 1996, I guess it was. And uh, I looked at the older guys in the firm and saying, well, I'm working 24-7. I'm in the office every weekend. I said, you know, this experience thing, I think it's overrated. Well, it is until you get experience and you realize the value of it. <laughs> and, and now I really sound like an old man, but uh, but the bottom line is, you know, everyone says, oh, go out and throw money at 10 opportunities. And one of those or two of those is going to hit, you know, for, for venture capital model. I don't believe in that. I believe you do thorough due diligence uh, on five companies and you figure out and you have the resources where you've got a network in place and you're talking to people that are like, hey, this is going on and this is going to hit in this space and these are the reasons why. And then it's about things that are analogous to other space. You say, okay, this looks like something I saw seven years ago. And me, I'm, I'm a copious note taker, so I've got notes on everything. And I'm like, let me look at that deal that I looked at and compare and contrast it and say, okay, well, where's the cash flow? You know, in the end, you want to clear away the yeah. complexity. You want to focus on, all right, is it cash flowing? You know, is it not? Is there a J curve involved where, okay, three months, four months, five months from now, it's going to pop and start being... It has some net profit. Okay, then where do you go? Do you have to get out in front of the pack and you need more capital, capital infusion at that point to invest in marketing and branding to make sure that you're going to be you know, the lead dog? Um, so to answer your question, it's really specific. It's case by case, and you've got to get in there and do the hard work of figuring out what that business is because I think, you know, uh, Preston, as we know, there's no excuse using <laughs> finance for not rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work. Um, of saying, I don't want to look at 10 companies. I want to have a system in place that gives me the opportunity to increase my probability of success after looking at five companies and picking that one or two. So it's not a one in 10 hit rate. It's a one in two or one in three hit rate. So it's yep. interesting that you, you say that because, I mean, it's really all about risk mitigation and being able to identify, okay, yeah, they, this these three things look great, but these other two things really offset that potential gain that I see. And so I guess my question is this, what is the biggest mistakes that you see startups having? If you had to narrow it down to three, like when you hear somebody say one thing or you see a specific thing, you're just like out the door, like, okay, this ain't going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to, uh, you know, the more, the more you learn and the more of a body of knowledge and frame of reference you have, the more simple you, you gravitate towards, simplicity you gravitate towards. And I, I hearken back to the days of my plea beer at West Point where um, my squad leader said, you know, proper prior planning prevents poor performance. And, yeah. uh, and you talk with some of these guys who are building a business and they fall in love with the technology. And, and that, I'm not saying that that's you know, bad. It's, it's a good thing to be passionate about what you're doing. But they fall in love with it so much that they start being delusional where it's like, wait a minute, you're not looking at where this company is going to be. It's like, you've got to be taking care of not your company today, your company a year from now, your company five years from now. It's like, you've got to have that vision. And if you don't have it now, you better get it quickly because if you're not taking care of things, then you're leaving your company and yourself susceptible to uh, people that come in and you know, basically steal your company, uh, not give you the proper valuation. Um, you know, there are bad guys out there. And, and uh, like any industry, Wall Street has bad guys and they'll come in there and say, okay, well, we're going to look at you for a while and then they'll tell you whatever you want to hear and then they'll come in and steal your business. Say, we're, we're going to take, you know, 51% of the equity or more uh, for a fire sale price. And, 
And that's because there's lack of prior planning. You've got to make sure you've, had, you've got balance sheet. You've got to have a war chest to take into any battle uh, that's going to be able to get your business through some tough times because any business is going to have tough times no matter how great the technology or what, what the case may be. And so you're saying they'll come in uh, and take 51% of the equity because they can foresee, oh my God, they're going to run out of cash at this point in time. They're going to be strapped. And so then we're just going to kind of swoop in like, like, you know, wolves and snatch up all that equity whenever that time comes. Is that what you're kind of referring to, Pete? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned wolves. I call it uh, the antelope situation where uh, the, the lions in, in the uh, Serengeti and they're looking at the antelope and they'll get them away from the herd. And they'll say, okay, so we're going to buy you next week. And they'll say, oh, great, fantastic. I'm going to get bought at a 10, 10x multiple on EBITDA and everything's wonderful. And and then all of a sudden it's like next week comes like, okay, I'm ready to take that dump the cash on me and then it gets drawn out and then all of a sudden it's a month. Yeah. It's like in, War of and attrition. They, they've, got the, <laughs> exactly. and they've got all the data. They know the cash burn rate. Yeah. You know, they know the debt service. They know everything that's going on. So it's like, and they can pinpoint, okay, let's talk to this guy, you know, three months from now when he's going to be in a hard, hard place. And then, uh, what happens, I'm not going to say it happens frequently, but that's, you know, if you don't plan and prepare and you're not looking out for your company, Exactly. It can be susceptible to the antelope situation. It, yeah, it goes can, totally to your point of if you're not planning and forecasting and having that foresight of where you're going, you're going to find yourself in that kind of situation. That's a fantastic point. I, Stig, you had a question there? Yeah, because uh, uh, Peter, you know, I was uh, I was thinking about how do you determine uh, the value of a company and perhaps also through the through the glass of a, um, of a venture capitalist. Um, is it is it very different than when you're looking at stocks for like uh, bigger companies to determine the value the same way? Absolutely, it's, it's worlds apart. Um, and it's funny because that's another lesson you learn with experience. Is you know you want to say, oh yeah, I'll value that company. I'll throw a dividend discount model or economic value added, or there's a million other ways to to value the company. Um, NPV cash flows, um, but through the years, I've found that the most valuable way of, of Approaching it is looking at comps. You know, you want to compare it to other companies that have had liquidity events, and that's real. You know, no, nothing's worth anything until it's sold. So, you know, when you're looking at these companies, and you know, I, I had one company in the last couple of weeks that was like, "Oh yeah, we had our patents valued at three million dollars." <laughs> <laughs> I kind of had to hold back the laughter, and I was like, "Okay, well, can you sell them tomorrow for three million dollars?" Like, uh. Well, the patent attorney told us that that they, we could. It was like, okay, who's he? You sell them to him buy? then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is he going to buy them from you? <laughs> so that was uh, that's something I've heard many times over um, from great traders. You know, uh, that's like a Paul Tudor Jones thing, where it's like, you know, it, it's not about worth anything until you sell it. And if you're selling it, selling to the person that sold it to you, then you're in trouble as well. Hey, Pete, I'm, I'm kind of curious. How many companies do you kind of see that come in that are looking for, for venture capital that uh, have a bottom line, have some net income, uh, 50% of them? Or what would be, would you say, on a ratio? 50% of the people come in with with a green in their bottom line? Um, yeah, I would say that uh, I'd say it's a little bit more because to have the kind of uh, the chutzpah to go out on your own, you, you usually um, have confidence and, and intelligence and you know how to make money. Um, not always the case, but I guess it's, uh, for me, through my network, uh, if I'm getting introduced to a company, I'm usually um, getting introduced to intelligent, um, thoughtful business owners that are kind of ahead of the game. Uh, I'll give you my, I had a couple of calls yesterday, and one of them was with a guy that owns an engineering company that has a technology that, uh, it's his third technology, he's been successful with the other two, so this is something that's already cash flowing. You know, it's already making money for him. Um, it ran. It got so much traction early on that he's run out of money because it's gotten that big. So those are nice situations to be in. Um, but to answer your question, Preston, I would say it's more. I think when you're talking fifty percent or less, it's probably a lot less than fifty percent if you're talking about all venture capital opportunities. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, but I would say that. Um, that, yeah, because, you know, anyone comes, we wake up this morning and it's like, hey, I've got an idea for a brand new bird feeder. Um, in fact, I do have, I have a bird feeder that's a squirrel-proof bird feeder that was uh, somebody thought up in the Midwest and has made a lot of money because uh, it 
it's activated that spins around the squirrel and throws them off the bird feeder. <laughs> oh my God. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So it's called the Yankee Yankee uh, flipper. I'm not getting any, any advertising, but I love the thing. It does work. Uh, <laughs> Yankee flip, and they have a funny video and it shows you, you know, the power, as you guys know all too well, the power of, uh, of media nowadays. It's like, you don't need CBS, NBC, um, you know, big networks because they have this, uh, this video on is it Vimeo or, or on yeah uh, Vimeo and YouTube. Yeah. YouTube probably it's YouTube. And it's called the Yankee flipper bird feeder. And somebody sent it to me, um, cause they knew I was, uh, trying to, trying to feed my birds and not the squirrels. And, uh, sure enough, it, it's gone viral. So, <laughs> so I'm really excited about every, all the opportunities that are out there. Well, we'll have a, we'll have a link in the show notes for people to pull that up if they want to see it. I know I want to see it. Um, I, I got a quick question for you. So, you know, whenever we're valuing stocks, Stig and I, if you look at the current market conditions here in November of 2014, you know, the thing that the discount rate I'm kind of trying to use and trying to find businesses on the market for is around 10%, but we're dealing with large cap companies and things like that. When you're dealing with venture capital, um, I've heard that the number is typically around 40 to 50% is the discount rate you guys like to use is kind of like a starting point. And I know each company that comes in is, is different, but are you really trying to get your money back within two years? Is that really kind of the way you look at it? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I'd like it back tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that, I think that, that goes back to the model I was talking about, which is what everyone refers to as, Oh, the venture capital model. I don't understand that model is C10 companies pick, Pick 10 companies, invest in them, spread it, you know, diversify, and then get your one or two. And that one or two better give you the money back in two years because you're licking your wounds on the other nine yeah. or eight. Um, so, so that's basically why I think everyone's like, that's where you have to get uh, for, for your successful company. When it's going to pop, you don't need to pop, you know, you don't need a two or three X. You need a 15, 20 X yeah. um, to get where you need to go uh, to pick up the pieces on all the all the uh, lost, you know, the, the sunk costs of, uh, of investing in the other uh, clunkers, let's call them. What, what's, the, uh, what's the typical characteristics of the, of the uh, companies that you're looking at? Uh, even though it's like small companies and startups, I, it's, I guess, you know, if you have a blog or something, it's not like we can, we can call up Peter and ask if he can fund us. I, <laughs> I, I guess that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm excited. There's a lot of other... Um, you know, things that are popping up, the crowdfunding type things. And I'm excited about that because, you know, I'm all about, uh, God bless the United States of America, let's build the economy. And that means getting capital to people who have brilliant ideas. And, you know, the model that's been around for so long on Wall Street is, you know, it's either you've got to have the relationships or you've got to have uh, whatever it takes to get that put in the door and get the meeting with the venture capital firm that will consider writing a check to you. Um, so now with this crowdfunding and everything else, you know, I think there's a lot more opportunity for, for getting out there. If, if you've got an idea, um, I think it is like, uh, social media is, is a way I'm a big fan. I have another company that, um, that's doing a lot of flying around and meeting with, uh, and doing, uh, retail distribution, you know, and just selling it to whole wholesale channels. And I'm like, guys, let's get, uh, let's look at the whole spectrum of opportunities for marketing and let's realize the power and the potential and the cost effectiveness of social media to get out there instead of having somebody hop on a plane and go to different cities and talk to retail. Let's at least test out going direct with, uh, with social media because you can fire with a rifle instead of a shotgun and you, you know exactly the demographics, especially with, you know, all the information we know or we can buy with data. I mean, I come from a structured credit background, so I'm about knowing everything about a person's uh, personal balance sheet and being able to loan on that. Um, same thing with being able to know, okay, that person loves to buy soaps or perfumes or whatever in Cincinnati. Okay, that's a person you want to have on an email distribution list to say that's a product that's going to strike, that's going to resonate with them. I know we're seeing that on our side, just with our business, the, the importance and how social media can be used. And the, the most amazing thing with it is, you have analytical data. So in, in marketing in the past, it's been, hey, let's send out a thousand flyers and you have no idea what the actual impact of those of that capital that was spent on that marketing campaign or whatever. But now it's it's amazing because it's all digital and you can actually see all the analytics behind it. I mean, that's one of the reasons Google's just so phenomenal. But that's a Absolutely. that's a sidebar in itself. But 
No, no, that's a great point because, uh, you know, I saw it early on in structured credit where you had Solomon Brothers uh, putting together the models as far as prepayment risk uh, way back in the day. And it was like, wow, look at them. They spent $100 million or, or more, whatever yeah. the number was, um, on building this incredible model. And it was a one variable model. It was like prepay or not prepay. And it was like, and that was powerful enough back there relatively to put them way ahead of the game. And obviously their alpha generation was phenomenal. And all of a sudden they spin off and do long-term capital. And it's like, but then they got ahead of themselves because they, they were playing mean reversion strategies and using a hundred times leverage. And that works until it doesn't. When it doesn't, it blows up. So. <laughs> it works until it doesn't. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so that was, um, that was fantastic. And, but that's basically it, Preston, exactly to your point, which is Google realized early on, it's all about the data. If you can pull data and get that data, that's powerful information, and you can run the algorithms over that data that are going to give you, pull out real information and useful information and timely information, then you're way ahead of the pack and you're going to be able to, uh, to make a ton of money. Yeah, it's funny that when you look at Google and their acquisition of like Waze, of YouTube, all these big networks, it's amazing because they, I think they have so much analytical data that they can see that uh, one of these, um, you know, these, these online companies, whenever they're starting to like grow and build really fast, they have some type of model that's giving them some type of tip off to snag up the YouTube, to snag up the, and I, it's just, fin it's, it's amazing. It, I mean, like I said, we could talk about this for a very long period of time and go off on a total tangent, just talking about Google. In fact, uh, Stig and I are reading a book about Google right now, so that's probably why it's in my head. But uh, anyway, let's <laughs> go ahead, Pete. You right. some it's Google. It's uh, I made an investment in a firm down in Baltimore called uh, Red Owl Analytics, and uh, and that's taking the lessons learned in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq as far as big data, real time acquisition of big data where there's communications or other things, and synthesizing that with incredible algorithms that pull that that can give you know a Fortune 500 company real-time intelligence and information yep. that they can use to, to help the companies. So Pete, uh, this is a question that Stig and I like to ask at the end of every interview. And uh, we find that we get probably the best uh, you know, information out of this question. And the question is, what is the best investment advice that you've ever received? Wow, uh, I've received a lot of good investment advice. Uh, and now I'm thinking about 20 years of uh, investment advice, and I'm coming up with a couple of things, but I think if I had to pick one, um, I'd say Arthur Rock. Um, Arthur Rock, I was blessed to, to have Arthur Rock as a client back at DLJ, and he uh, was one of the founders of, of venture capital, really. Um, he was at Harvard Business School and, uh, and really forward-thinking, uh, incredible man. So anyway, um, he said, uh, it was, again, going back to simplicity, genius is simple, right? And uh, what Arthur Rock told me you know, personally was what Warren Buffett tells the world, which is never be afraid to let a, an opportunity go by if it doesn't feel right. And I've actually learned to value what my gut tells me. Um, and when I, and I, I, don't, I don't like using gut because your gut is your brain actually synthesizing all the data of 20 years of experience. And you know, whether you know what's going on or not, you're actually, it's, I'm fascinated with the brain too. Uh, what your neocortex does is amazing and you ought to listen to it because it's actually synthesizing memories and patterns throughout a lifetime and if your brain is saying wait something doesn't feel right there's something to that there's maybe you can't point at it or you can't quantify it but it might be you know you can't quantify it but it is quantifiable and it's something that your synapses are, are telling you and your axons and dendrites are you know, or a machine, and they're a damn good machine. So you better listen to it when you see an opportunity and something said, whether it's a person that, you know, you're like, wait a minute, that, that seems unethical or, you know, little, look for little hints that are going to tell you, no, uh, I'm not going to deal with that person um, because of ethical issues or because of, um, you know, they're not, they're not building the business the right way and they don't want to get on track to do it the right way. That was really a really great uh, tip, Peter. Um, as you probably also know, Preston and I are really big on, on books. Um, do you have any recommendation to a really good investment book, perhaps something that you would use yourself? Uh, well, it's funny you mention that because I always do. Sunday nights I do my um, mentoring. If somebody is coming out of the military, they always get my time. And uh, I used to tell them a list of books. Um, 
And now the first thing I tell them is work with the right people. And this goes back to, you know, your gut. Um, if you think you're working with the wrong people, you probably are working with the wrong people and you need to get out of there. Uh, so that's the first advice I give to people. Uh, and then when I go into books, I give them the handbook of alternative investments, um, which is, yeah, the first thing you want to do is, is have that body of knowledge to understand the space. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to, to kind of have the opportunity, um, you know, pop up to work in alternatives early on. But you, know, you got to keep your eyes open and not keep your eyes open right in front of you, but look 360 degrees and every other perspective you can actually reach for to see new opportunities. And if I was in another department at DLJ when I saw alternatives start to grow, and I basically did everything to transfer over to that group because I knew the promise of alternative investments was, was huge. Um, so as far as a book, yeah, I'd start off with a handbook of alternative investments. And then I also say things like uh, seven habits of highly effective people, just, you know, how to make sure you're working well within a group. You know, it's funny on Wall Street, sometimes you, you get, come out of a meeting and you're like, you know, that person never played a team sport in their entire life. <laughs> you know, the, whole, <laughs> the whole thing is a soliloquy of how great I am. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> so you're saying ego okay. is big at, on Wall Street? That doesn't sound right. No. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> Pete, amazing feedback. I mean, that's just phenomenal. I know that uh, everyone in the audience is definitely uh, taking notes and uh, listening to some of the things that you're uh, putting out here. So um, we would like to really thank you. For anyone that's uh, interested in uh, learning more about Pete, uh, he owns his, his bank, his investment bank that he owns is called Campfire Capital. Uh, we'll have a link to the site on our show notes if you're interested in in visiting there and, and contacting Pete. The website is very boring, but uh, it's boring by design because I've got enough <laughs> enough people that are doing business with me. That I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, doing a lot in marketing, let's say. And I have other, I have other interests as well, quite a few other interests. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, Pete, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate everything that you've uh, provided to our audience. Appreciate it. Great spending time with you, Preston and Stig. Great, great uh, spending time with you. Okay, so let's go to our question that somebody from our audience had submitted to our website. Uh, and if you want to submit a question, you can go to asktheinvestors.com and submit your question. And this question comes from Raymond Sheedy. And Raymond says, hypothetically, if you buy all of a company's shares outstanding, will you own the whole company outright? Or does the business keep some of the shares for itself and therefore unavailable to the average investor? For example, when a business announces a share buyback, what happens to those shares? So, Raymond, this one's pretty straightforward. If you own all the shares of the business, then you absolutely own 100% of the business. Um, where you might be getting confused is that whenever a company does a share buyback, um, that benefits if there's multiple owners. But if you were the sole owner and you owned 100% of that business, there would be no reason for you to be buying back shares from yourself because at that point you'd be the only person that would own it. Okay, so that concludes our show for today, and uh, we'd like to thank Pete Godet for coming on the show. I'd like to thank Raymond for uh, submitting his question. We'll put a free signed copy of the Warren Buffett accounting book in the mail for you. And thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 